<clears throat> You're fasting for Ramadan. It's really a marathon. You're an Islamic paragon. But you could go for some chicken parmesan. What can you do to make it till dark? Blow something up in a city or park. Now, of course, we know that's not happening, ladies and gentlemen. This week in Jihad has no Jihad because it is Ramadan. It is the time of peace. And we are here with the great Dr. David Wood. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, David. It, isn't it great that you never have a, a bombathon during Ramadan? Never. There is no Jihad this week because it's Ramadan. And so we know that all the Muslims are praying, fasting, and making the world a better place. And so for that, we can all be grateful. And I guess that's the show for tonight, David. <laughs> we could we could take the rest of Ramadan off. Yep, that's it. Unfortunately, I guess we should do a little bit of cleanup, though, before we go. Because there were a few people, misunderstanders of Ramadan, <laughs> who have indeed gone so far as to commit violence. What we have so far in day six of Ramadan, according to the excellent thereligionofpeace.com, Ramadan Bombathon, 15 attacks, 50 killed so far this Ramadan. Now we know that that means that there were at least 15 Muslims who somehow did not understand properly that Ramadan is a time for them to put away their swords and reach out in peace to all people of goodwill. In any case, though, this is, after all, this week in Jihad. And so I guess we have a moral duty to take three, four, maybe even five minutes, David, and go through some of the Jihad activity of the past week. So we can start in Nigeria... In Nigeria, there have been actually several attacks in the last few days. There were five people killed and a youth leader abducted in Benue State. Meanwhile, in Bayelsa State, Islamic jihadis stormed a fishing settlement, a popular fishing area known as Lake Sam. And they uh, murdered a traditional chief there whose name was Bob Wilson. I uh, find that interesting that you would have a traditional chief named Bob Wilson, but that's what was reported. Chief Me Bob sounds cool, though. Yeah, I think I'm actually going to take that on. Uh, <clears throat> if somebody would appoint me Sarkin Zongo or something like that, I could be Chief Bob. Anyway, Or, or, or you, yes? could be your own, you could be your own version of the name. Ready for it? Yes. Bobbert. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. We'll work on it. In Ondo State, we had jihadis hacking non-Muslims to death with machetes and kidnapping others in a jihad raid. So why they decided to do this during Ramadan is baffling, David. Why on earth would they do that? Uh, that's one of life's great mysteries because, um, you know, as long as we determine what Islam teaches based on the feelings and speculations of Western politicians and journalists, there, there can't be any connection, right? Indeed, none. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it, everyone, isn't that weird, by the way? Like, like everyone, it's like people have their own mindset of this is what a religion would do. Mm -hmm. If there's something, uh, if there's an especially holy day, they're going to be drawing closer to the God of peace and love and therefore things are going to get more peaceful and more loving and that's how things will work and then they apply that to every other religious system in the world as if all religions teach the same things it's really it's really interesting and and no amount of reality can snap them out of that and it's interesting to note as well that the people who do this are often quite anti-christian in po in the post-christian west and yet their paradigm for what a religion is is taken entirely from christianity Yep. And that's why they assume that if you're going to be getting closer to Allah, you must be getting more benign and peaceful because that's what's, what Allah must be all about. That's what religions are all about, isn't it? 
Yeah, and that's uh, and and notice it's a, uh, I mean you can you can. You can show them terrorist attack after terrorist attack. You can show them how uh, terrorist attacks spike during Ramadan. You can show them why it happens. You can go to their sources and port, point these things out. But it's it's weird that they take it as like some sort of axiom. All religions teach the same thing. It has to be that way. And nothing will ever change my mind about that. And yep. uh, it's, wild, it's wild stuff. And yet the people who don't get the message persistently are those pesky misunderstanders of Islam and misunderstanders of Ramadan. We had more in Belgium, David, this Pete, this past week. On Monday evening, the Antwerp Federal Police, they uh, arrested, they carried out five searches in Molenbeek and in other heavily Muslim areas and arrested eight people foiling a massacre plot. Of course, the available... Uh, News stories did not identify the terrorists in question at all. So it's possible that they were white supremacists or right-wing extremists of some kind. However, Mormons? it's likely... Or Mormons, yeah, or Amish. But since uh, you do have them from Molenbeek, Zaventum, areas where there are large concentrations of Muslims, it does appear likely that these were yet more... Muslims misunderstanding the true nature of Ramadan. It's it's weird that that all these jihadis who misunderstand their religion never ever go to Western journalists to learn about Islam. They don't. It's like they get their information from somewhere other than than Western politicians and Western journalists. Well, where, I don't know where they're. I don't know where they're. I don't know where they're going. I don't know where they're, they're going. How could you learn anything except from Western politicians and journalists? It's the only it's the only source of reliable information about your religion, right? Like everyone knows yeah. that as soon as you 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 they under, people understand you got to recite the Shahada. Once you recite the Shahada and become a Muslim, you then want to gather information about your new religion, your newfound faith. So you go to a West, you go to CNN and ask them what Islam teaches, and then mm -hmm. you just go with that. And that's how things are supposed to work. But I don't know, man. Jihadis just never get the picture. They keep going somewhere else for all their information about Islam. I just don't understand. When I want to know about Islam, I go to Pope Francis. Yeah, I know. Right? Yeah. Who else? In Greece, we also had a foiled jihad plot this Ramadan where uh, two Pakistani migrants were arrested, they were plotting to attack a restaurant that is also the site of a synagogue. This is a, uh, a Jewish restaurant, actually. That's how it was identified in the Greek City Times. And uh, Chabad has, a, uh, has worship there on off hours. And so these uh, Pakistani migrants were going to massacre as many people as they could, and they had an arrangement with the mastermind of their jihad terror network that they would receive 15,000 euros, which is about $16,250 for each person they killed. Quite a bargain. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, uh, that's, a, new, that's a new twist for, uh, for the jihad, that they are actually getting paid by the murdered person. That's something I haven't come across before. Yeah, um, I, I mean, it kind of it, it kind of makes sense in, in the sense that, you know, it's, it's built into Muhammad's understanding of Islam, that the person that the person who funds the jihad gets the same reward. But the, the, the concept is that other people are actually some somehow paying you at least for preparations and to to build your weapons and so on but i mean what why not why not just shower them with money well you'd think the virgins would be enough you know you'd think that they would get the, the, i mean are they so earthly minded aren't there passages of the quran i can think of several offhand as a matter of fact that scold people for wanting worldly glory saying they should kill the captives rather than ransom them in 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 chapter 8 67 and 60 to 69 the, the 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 idea is that this is uh it's unacceptable for them to want to get earthly gain 
Yeah, but 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 I mean, keep in mind how Muhammad actually got people on board with his plan. He said, y- y- you know, the Hadith, he said, uh, if, if you join me and you you help me go out and fight these people, then there are only two possibilities. Either you re- you return home safely with rewards and war booty or you go to paradise and you get to spend eternity deflowering virgins. Win win. So either way, as long as you join me and go out and fight the people I tell you to fight, you you either get stuff now in this world or you get stuff in the hereafter. Either way, you get stuff because, uh, you know, you th- that's the only way to uh, appeal to people, apparently, uh, in this religion. But uh, but notice similar concept. Hey, you jihadis go out and slaughter a bunch of people in the name of Allah. If you happen to get killed, you know, you go there and you get all your virgins. But even if you don't, we're going to make it rain money. We're going to make it rain money. We're going to shower you with euros. And uh, either way, you're either way, you're 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 set. Yeah, well, that win win situation, I think, has been underestimated throughout history as being a primary reason why the jihadis have been a formidable fighting force in so many different areas for so many centuries because they don't have anything to lose, really. They, they figure they win either way. All right, yep. also in Ramadan, very interesting development, David, for the very first time, as far as I know, and I think this is for the first time in modern history, David, nothing less, the French police have actually admitted that there is indeed more violence during Ramadan than they deal with at other times. Huh. Yeah, it's 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 really unprecedented, but... Uh, oh, it, hang on, hang. How, how many years have we been covering the Ramadan Bamathon? Well, uh, I started Jihad Watch in 2003, so that's 20 years even now. And and Glenn over at the Religion of Peace, he's always kept a running uh, running tab. And I I made videos for several years, especially during the ISIS years, talking about the Ramadan bombathon, how there's always this spike in terror. And you you mean uh, so it 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 only yeah. takes them four it only takes the French fourteen centuries to figure this out. That's good. Okay. Yep. Be- better late than never. I'll... See, there were a couple of stabbings in Montpellier. And this police source says, many incidents have been punctuating Ramadan for four days, both at La Mousson and at Plan Caban. I don't know, whatever. That, that's, that, uh, that's, that's, that's poor choice of words. Punctuating? It yes, sounds okay. like you know, stabbing you and says, so, punctuate you. Yeah, Ramadan. absolutely. Yeah. And he says, uh, this phenomenon is not new. Each year during Ramadan, the fights are numerous. Serious and less serious, but there are always fights during Ramadan. And this, I've never seen an authority in the West admit that before. Not just in France. So but progress is slow, but I guess it does happen. Yes, yes, indeed. This is interesting, though, because over the past few weeks, you've shared multiple stories where people are not as stupid as we normally take them to be. I've got a massive stupid infidel section this week, though. Yeah, I know. Well, I know you're, you're not doing away with the stupid infidels, but we're we're ending up with occasional stories of smart, common sense at common sense uh, yeah. infidels. Well, maybe I'll have to start a section common sense infidels, but it's not gonna be a not s- non stupid infidels. <laughs> yes. You mentioned uh, technological advance a, a minute ago, and that reminded me of the story out of Spain that uh, in Barcelona. These people were on a flight to Tel Aviv, and there was a an Islamic jihadi on the flight who started to use airdrop to send terrorist threats to the other people on the flight. And I thought, nice. well, that's a nice technological innovation there for the jihad. That would be pretty scary, though, right? You're sitting here messing around on your phone, and you start getting uh, little messages. I'm on this yeah. flight, too. I'm on this flight, too. You're, Allah you're Allah dead. Akbar. You're dead, yeah. Allah Akbar. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. What a world. All right. Uh, there's a lot more jihad, kinetic jihad, but I think maybe we should dip into the stupid infidels a bit. Hang on, hang on. Now, this is this is this is interesting. That what would you do in that situation? Someone's dropping you a message. I'd be inclined to like shut up. Your prophet's fake, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, 
you, you gonna you, you about to take down this plane for that child molester you you worship <laughs> that'd be fun <laughs> that'd actually oh be yeah interesting. <laughs> Yeah, if he's going to blow everything up, you know, might as well go out with a blaze of glory. Might as well. Might as well go out with a blaze of mockery. Indeed. Okay. Uh, story out of the UK. Always a rich vein for stupid infidels, the UK. And we have the headline is good enough in itself from the Daily Mail. Asylum seekers say they're bored. The food is bad. And it's like living in jail in the three and four star hotels where taxpayers are footing their bill. And that was one thing. But I thought that one of the other interesting things about this story was a woman in the area of one of these hotels. And it says, it seems wrong that they're getting a free roof over their head in a nice hotel. You see them walking around with nice iPhones in smart clothes. They're all men. You do not see any women or children. What about we, we, that? We've been noticing that for years. That, Indeed. Uh, you know, you had this, uh, you know, after the rise, of, you know, the Arab Spring and ISIS and all this, and you had thousands, thousands of the migrants um, fleeing these war-torn zones and Europeans saying, ah, look at all these poor people. We have to take them all in because they can't survive and it's all like 22 and 24 year old guys yep it's like so 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 the, these are the guys who are leaving leaving behind their mothers and sisters in this area where there's not where there's there's it's just too unsafe for them they're leaving their their wives and mothers and sisters and daughters and children behind um in this war-torn area and the people who are it, it's an interesting it's an interesting fact the people who are best able to survive in a war zone are also the people who are best able to flee right mm -hmm. you know what i mean the yeah. people who are who are who are youngest and strongest and fittest and best at climbing over things and so on and and the the the, the strongest most fit most capable people those are the, the the people who are best able to survive there are the people who are best mm -hmm. able to leave and leave everyone behind and boy do they love doing that now, why might they be doing that? What on earth is motivating them to come to the West without their families? Um, well, I mean, it's weird because, I mean, any, I mean, anyone else in all of history would look at that as like supreme cowardice, right? It's, it's like, dude, dude, if, if you, if, if you're going to, if you're going to get to my wife and kids, you're going to you're going to have to go through me for you're going to I'm going to have to be a dead body before you get to my to my wife and kids. But there, nope, uh, nope, I can always get a new wife and kids over here in the UK. Ali said that when Aisha was accused of adultery and was about to be stoned to death and Muhammad was all upset because he liked her. And Ali says, what are you so upset about? You can just get another wife. Yep. And so, uh, yeah, these guys are coming actually because of chapter 4, verse 100 of the Quran, which is a guarantee of rewards from Allah for emigrating for his sake. And of course, nobody in the West has any awareness that this might be a motivation for at least some of the emigrants. But And uh, Kurt, Kurt Henneman in the chat said, there are 16 at the borders. <laughs> He's right about that, right? Yeah. All these, oh, yeah. all these twenty-four, all these uh, tens of thousands of twenty-four-year-olds marching, uh, you know, marching yeah. across, uh, marching out of the Middle East and into Europe and so on. Suddenly, they're all sixteen years old when they get to the border. Oh, I'm, I'm a kid. I'm just sixteen. You, you, you look like you know you're twenty-four. Ah, it's just because of the tough times back home. It's <laughs> made me yeah. look older. Now, oh, oops, I seem to have forgotten my ID card as I fled from the war zone, leaving behind my, uh, you know, my wife and mother and my seven children. Oh, I mean, I'm 16. I, I don't have seven children. Uh, interesting. I see the pictures. It's incredible. You know, you, I'm sure you've seen them. The guys getting off the boats and uh, in, uh, in England and they're, they're, then they go to school and they're in like third grade and they're foot <laughs> foot yeah. taller than everybody else and a little mustache coming. And... They're they're uh, <laughs> they're they're breaking they're breaking uh, records in soccer and stuff because they're competing against little kids. Yep. <laughs> Guy, guys in third grade with a beard. That's funny. <laughs> yep. 
All right, also, the UK, they're shocked, shocked, David, because 68% of the Muslims in England and Wales live in areas with high unemployment. And unemployment is much uh, greater among Muslims in the UK than it is among non-Muslims. Now, that's because of Islamophobia and racism, isn't it? Yeah, that and because uh, a lot of Muslims, because of what Muhammad said, uh, have a problem with the, the concept of paying taxes to an infidel government that makes mischief in Muslim lands. And therefore, it is better to um, to be at least officially, at least officially uh, without a job and to be paid by that government, because now they're it's like they're paying you a form of a jizya. They're paying you. And then you're not sinning by making money and having to give a percentage to this infidel government. And so it's just, uh, and, and, but I have to say, they're totally, they're totally, they're totally correct, right? And from, yeah. an Islamic, per, from an Islamic perspective, you would be better off um, uh, being completely out of work and getting, getting paid by the government than you would working and paying money to that government. You would think that the infidel government might be aware of this and take measures to stop it. But of course, in Scotland now, the new leader of the infidel government is none other than Hamza Yusuf, who is himself an observant Muslim, who after he became the leader in Scotland, tweeted pictures of himself and his family with his hijab wearing wife, breaking the Ramadan fast for the first time in the wherever they live the Butte House, or I think it's called, in any case. Uh, so he's not likely, although he's a, a far-left politician, he's not likely to take any steps to, actually because he's a far-left politician, he's not likely to take any steps to curb this immigration or to put it on a more responsible footing in terms of the people who come in and then go immediately on welfare. Isn't it, isn't it weird that I don't know. Maybe it's just skewed by movies or something like that. But I think of like the the I think of Scottish people as like super tough, right? Guess Braveheart, right? You know, saw Braveheart. Braveheart. You don't want to go messing around with with the Scottish, right? But it's it's the same thing with like Norwegians. Like you guys were Vikings. How did you become the biggest, weakest cowards in the entire universe in just a couple of couple of centuries? Anyway, I don't know. Well, you know, actually. Reminds me of when I was in Iceland in 2017 and uh, got poisoned, but that's another story. Um, I got better. The uh, Icelandic people who invited us to speak, one of them took us aside at one point and was saying, you know, I'm really concerned about this because uh, nobody in Iceland has any experience of how to deal with anything, any kind of strife any kind of civil strife, we haven't fought a war in a thousand years. And I thought, yeah, you know, that's that's very tough. And you're going to be, you're going to, you're, they're, of course, another leftist government, and they're bringing in large numbers of Muslim migrants. So among them will be jihadis. They're going to be dealing with this. And nobody has any idea how. Yeah, and no, I mean, it is it's Europe and uh, even more so the Americas. We've uh, we've had a life of relative ease for mm -hmm. several decades compared to most people down through history and compared to lots of people in different parts of the world. But basically, the, 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 the looming problem is when various uh, structures in society start to break down, there are people who've never been through anything in their lives and they're going to be completely incapable of dealing with it unless the government rushes in and uh, establishes a, a tyranny to give them some level of, of peace. But other people in the world who've been through stuff and can deal with it, they're going to be in a, they're going to be a much better. Uh, just to give an example, like, like I'm from, I'm from, uh, I'm from West Virginia trailer park. I have a bunch of relatives who are hillbillies making moonshine, all that stuff, got all that stuff. 
uh, I'll be okay. <laughs> right? So, so things start breaking down. I'll be okay. I'll go hunt squirrels and rabbits and deer and live in the woods. I'm good. And, and other people, not, not so much. And all these, uh, you know, like <laughs> you just get the impression. We see one of these like Antifa guys coming by. Ah, we want anarchy. Like, dude, if you had anarchy, you were going to get slapped around so much, right? It's like you, you are the last person on the planet that would do well in an anarchy. You only can advocate anarchy because you're in a society that protects people from slapping the crap out of you when you say when you spout that nonsense. Um, and yet it's uh, I don't know, we seem hurt. We, 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 we all we all I don't know. We, we've, we've built up these civilizations that are that are uh, that are so nice and comfortable compared to what everyone else has had to deal with through history that we're now incapable of dealing with any sort of discomfort and that's not gonna that's just not gonna end well i don't think indeed no doubt about that and a lot of these people they have no idea what's coming you know they think that uh when it breaks down they can demand that the person who comes to take their home is you know give me tell me your pronouns first and it's, it's all going to be just absurd. But anyway. Uh, all right. Uh, speaking of absurd, also out of the UK, we had a hate crime, David. We had two hate crimes. Two elderly Muslims were set on fire as they left mosques. David, did you do it? Uh, no, but we need, to, we need to catch the Islamophobes who did this. That's right. Iman Atta of Tel Mama, the hate crime monitor, he said to Al Jazeera, the two recent deeply troubling incidents where two elderly Muslims have been set on fire as they left mosques are shocking. We ask all communities to remain alert and vigilant, whether at mosque or in public area. This is especially the case because Ramadan is just around the corner. This was a few days ago. Well, well if... I, I, I have to say I agree completely. Uh, we will not stop. We will not stop until these the perpetrators have been captured and punished accordingly they caught him good I'm, good 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 no, what did they do to, to this court. what did they do to this islamophobic bigot they found out he was a somali muslim <sighs> See, From... keep in mind keep in mind i had no clue what you were talking about not familiar with this story but i knew it i somehow knew it the entire time because just because that's happened thousands and thousands. Whenever you hear attack on Muslims, keep in mind there can be an attacks on there can be attacks on Muslims. There are people who are who are very upset. There, I see people in the in the comment section of videos. Ah, we need to nuke the Kaaba and this and that. I see there are people who are hostile, but it's the same thing that we've talked about before with like when there's like a mosque attack in Pakistan. Someone ah, someone blew up a mosque. You think okay, there there are Christians there, there are Hindus there. They have a lot of grievances based on the way they've been treated, but you just know from experience it tends to be other Muslims and other Muslim groups. So, so it, in other words, until the details come in, you have to say, okay, that there are multiple possibilities, but given given the way things have gone, it kind of leans significantly in the direction of Muslim on Muslim. Yep, weird stuff. Very weird. It's a weird age. Also in the UK. We uh, have the case of an anonymous rapist from Iran who has been fighting deportation. And he has won his case. He does not have to leave the UK because he could face persecution back in Iran. That and would the, be tragic. Yeah, the, the his his well being is much more important than that of his potential victims. Uh, I mean, they seem to have imported a disproportionate number of rape rapists, don't you think? So, I mean, it would be kind of weird to suddenly exclude rapists. I mean, right? Yeah, can't have I mean, that. I mean, it's it's it, they, they've they've had so many of them. I mean, the, the only surprising part there is it's from Iran and not Pakistan. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's to the point where it seems like it, it almost seems like they're trying <laughs> to bring in rapists. I mean, you how do you end up with such a disproportionately large number of of rapists to where it like massively skews all crime statistics because of the number of rapists you're bringing in? 
They're either extraordinarily stupid or extraordinarily evil. But I don't think there's a third option when you're talking about the British government. Yep. Stupid All right. or evil. Stupid or evil. Which one is it, ladies and gentlemen? Stupid or evil. We could have a vote, have a, have a contest. Or, I mean, yeah, the third option would be uh, both. <laughs> yes, yes. Stupid and evil. That's a bad combination there. Indeed. All right. Uh, it, over in Italy, there was yet another asylum seeker from Tunisia this time. His name is Mohammed. And he stabbed an Italian soldier. Where did he stab the soldier, David? Uh, um, uh, here. Bingo. It's astonishing how you just keep being right about these things. Psychic. Anyway, you have a... Uh, Fake Tunisian passport here. Actually, he might not be a Tunisian at all. But in any case, um, he is very clear he was caught in killing this soldier. And what do you think the Italian police said about his motive? Uh, some version of motive undetermined, still looking for a motive, no, un no clear motive, something like that. You are correct, sir. They wow. are baffled as to how the, why this could have happened. Why on earth would a grateful asylum seeker attack a soldier of the very government that has been so generous to him? It, it's so counterintuitive. Yeah, and I mean, like, I understand why they would think that way. I just don't understand why they can never modify that in light of reality and in light of evidence, right? Like if you just sat back and thought, you didn't know anything about, especially if you've been, if you've been bombarded with the idea all your life that Islam is a religion of peace, tolerance, and candy-coated raindrops. If you've been taught that all your life, and just as a just as a weird thought experiment, you think, hey, you know, there's there are people who are in bad parts of the world and then we take them in to, you know, a place where they can live and, and flourish and so on. So obviously they're going to be happy. I get it. I get believing all of that. It makes sense in your in your head. What I don't understand is that after thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of terrorist attacks, you absolutely refuse to modify your position at all. It's a it's a it's a form of irrationality, right? I mean, it's it's uh, whatever probability you're assigning to some hypothesis, as evidence comes in that affects that, you're supposed to update your confidence in your hypothesis based on the evidence that's coming in. When you say, here's my hypothesis and no amount of evidence can ever change it, well, that, that's just weird. It's, it's pretty, I have to say, it's, it's pretty unscientific, Robert. Yes. We live in an age of tremendous superstition masquerading as an age of science. All right. Every, uh, every, everything is feelings. It's all it's what do you feel about this? And your feelings, of course, have been trained and conditioned by the, the media and Hollywood and everything else. But whatever your feelings are, don't let evidence shake you out of that ever for any purpose. Yeah. And and we're the champions of science somehow. <laughs> oh, speaking of uh, never, ever getting the message, let's look at this gentleman. This is a young man named Lloyd Gutton. And he looks about 12. He also looks like a Lloyd Gutton. <laughs> Lloyd Gutton. And he converted to Islam. 17-year-old son of a farmer in Wales. And he got a butcher's knife and a heavy claw hammer. He wrote down on a piece of paper, I am a soldier of the Islamic State. And Justin Bieber was coming to sing. Does he sing, Justin Bieber? He was coming to sing. Yes. In, not, uh, well, but, not well, but yes. Yes, I expect, I expect not. And uh, coming to sing in Cardiff in Wales. And Lloyd Gutton was going to be there to murder him for Allah. But he was caught. Here's young Lloyd once again. There he is, 17 years old, farmer's son. Looks sad. No virgins. Yeah, he got caught. He couldn't kill Justin Bieber. 
Uh, but here again is a convert to Islam. Now, we're always told that, con that Islam is peaceful. Every last Western politician knows that Islam is peaceful. And so if Lloyd Gutton converts to Islam, he's going to be peaceful, right? And yet Lloyd Gutton and so many other converts to Islam end up going jihad. And nobody ever seems to get the message that there is some perhaps connection between the teachings of Islam to which the young man is newly acquainted and his turn to violence. It is a. I, I guess it goes back to what we're what we're just talking about. You have your your idea in your head, based on all the nonsense you've absorbed, that you've been bombarded with for years, and then. I don't know. You've just been trained to not take anything as evidence to the contrary, and and we know that we know why that is. That's a it's a it's a form of manipulation in the sense that. If you ever become slightly suspicious that Islam actually promotes violence, you're you're a racist and an Islamophobe. And people don't like being, you know, racists and Islamophobes. They don't want to they don't want to be that. And therefore, the conclusion is off limits. You can never actually look at the evidence and come to a to an informed decision. So you just have to keep reciting it. Uh, it's a religion of peace. It's a religion of peace. It's a, li a religion of peace. No matter what else happens. And then okay, but. A lot of people are going to die because you're scared of being called an Islamophobe. Yep. And speaking of being scared to be called an Islamophobe, let's go to the Vatican. And we have a message for Ramadan. A message of the dicastery for interreligious dialogue. I don't know what a dicast... What's a dicastery, David? Uh... Ha! Everyone knows that, Robert, but we don't need to go into it. <laughs> Some kind of group. They have some group for interreligious dialogue. Two Muslims for the month of Ramadan and Eid al-Fitr 1444 AH 2023 AD. And this was uh, written by His Eminence Cardinal Miguel Angel Ayuso Guijo. And the secretary of the same dicastery. Oh my goodness. Are you ready for this? The Reverend Monsignor Indunil Kodithuwaku Janakaratne Kankana Malage. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to change my name to that. That. <laughs> that. Yes. Anyway, it starts out this way, David. Dear Muslim brothers and sisters, the month of Ramadan is important for you, but also for your friends, neighbors, and fellow believers in other religions. In particular, Christians. Do you know any Christians for whom the month of Ramadan is important? Um, I, I, I guess I guess technically, if it's a year like this where it happens to overlap with Easter, there's like a weird sense. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what in the world anyone could be talking about. Yeah, uh, I think that this is just wishful thinking on their part. And it gets worse, of course. Uh, all right. You were, we are aware, dear friends, that peaceful and friendly coexistence faces many challenges and threats. Extremism, radicalism, polemics, disputes, and religiously motivated violence. Did you see what they did there, David? Extremism, radicalism, polemics, disputes, and religiously motivated violence threaten peaceful and friendly coexistence. So it's not just religiously motivated violence. It's not just that Muslims are killing Christians in Nigeria and everywhere else. It's also that there are people like you out there and me engaging in disputes. If you would stop that, then there would be peace. I've got a point. I've got a point. <laughs> if, if, we, if we just stopped reporting the jihad, then it would just go away and everyone's hearts would melt and everyone knows. The threats, but they say... What's By that? the way, you you want to know how dumb I am? <laughs> uh, how dumb are you? Like, uh, like just just in the the stupid. You just gave that long ridiculous name. Yes. And then I was like, it's actually a beautiful Sri Lankan name. Yeah, I was like, hey, there was a there's an even cooler name than that. Uh, it was by 
it was by the physician. I can't remember his name. So then I'm sitting here looking it up because then I have to know the person's name. And it was uh, his Paracelsus. They just call him Paracelsus because his real name is, is was uh, Theophrastus von Hohenheim, Philippus Aureolus, Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. I always thought that was <laughs> like the, the coolest name ever. That's a very good name. That's a good Bombastus, name. Bombastus von Hohenheim. If I, I, I want to name one of my kids Bombastus. That sounds and, pretty... Uh, and you got von Hohenheim in there twice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. That, that's his full... Okay, no, I read it together with his uh, his uh, his abbreviate. He's got his... He's called P- Paracelsus. Then he's got his abbreviated name. Then he's got the full name. Phil- Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. Oh, okay, uh, okay. I would have gone by Mr. Bombastus. I don't know. I still like Indunil Kodi Thuwaku Janakaratne Kankana Malage. Does that, that sounds so, sounds cool. I, yeah. Like, how do we not do that? How do we not? You can name your kids whatever you want. You can do that. Why don't we do that? Anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah, too late. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. I had one queued up here and once again have lost it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Back to Antwerp where we had a jihad attack foiled. We also had threats during this Ramadan. You see these people here, David? Let me get them up here. Here we go. Uh, This uh, individual with the tattoos and multicolored hair in the middle. A couple of other, uh, what do you call these people? Millennials? Stoners? No idea. No idea. But they are. Yeah, gamers. I don't know. Gen Z, I don't know. Anyway, uh, they are Merhaba, which is a group in Antwerp of self-described LGBTQIA+. I don't even know what all this stands for anymore. It's getting ridiculous. Uh, Anyway, they are Muslims of the LGBTQIA+ community. And they were going to hold a queer iftar for Ramadan. A queer iftar. And they were going to have it at a hall in Antwerp. But when the Muslim, the other Muslims, found out about it, they were so angry that they inundated these people with death threats and the venue canceled the queer iftar. Now, I guess nobody saw that coming. Everybody figured, well, it's a religion of peace, right? Yeah, and I mean, isn't that interesting, though? Because if that, if if some LGBTQ Muslims had been threatened by anyone else in the world, uh, the entire nation would have rallied around them to protect them and make sure that it goes on and make sure that they have the, the actual army standing outside to protect them. Mm-hmm. But uh, nope, it's uh, it's it's Muslims threatening them, so uh, we'll just uh, sweep this whole plan under the rug. I, I, mean, that, I mean, uh... I mean, think about it. I mean, you are combining. I mean, LGBTQ Muslims. I mean, those are like under no circumstances can you question or criticize or disagree with anything from either group. If you combine them, that is like that's like the World Series of <laughs> uncriticizability right there. That's right. And also, like we have on the screen right now, it's another Chickens for KFC group. Because, of course, once the Sharia observant Muslims catch the LGBTQ Muslims, they might find themselves diving off the top of a building. This is Kabil Bayo. Can you see him? Mm -hmm. Kabil Bayo is this gentleman's name. He's got a smart little mustache there, and he's also got that big stick. He is a Pakistani police officer in the Kanpur police station. And what he did when Ramadan began was that he went out with that stick. Let's see old Kabil Bayo again. He went out holding that big stick, and he used it to hit Hindus who were eating. Now... Hindus actually do not fast during Ramadan. But Kabil Bayo, he went around hitting people with this stick for not observing Ramadan, 
when they were not even Muslims. Now, I thought this was interesting because we're often told in the West, you know, you remember, you may remember anyway, 10, 15 years ago, there were some initiatives in several states to actually outlaw Sharia in several American states. And the Council on American Islamic Relations was livid and they fought very hard against these initiatives and they killed them on the grounds of religious freedom. And they insisted that Sharia had nothing to do with non-Muslims at all. It was completely applicable only to Muslims. Yeah, they, they said, I remember. Uh, matter of fact, it, it was, uh, it was uh, news organizations like CNN as well. Uh, they, they, were, they were all over it. And it was, the claim was, Sharia is just things like, like praying and fasting during Ramadan. It's got nothing to do with anyone else. So if you're against Sharia, you're saying Muslims don't have these rights to do these things. And, but that's absurd. And therefore, you need to uh, drop anything about a uh, United States uh, government not enforcing Sharia. You got to got to drop all these claims. Yep, and it worked. It worked great. All right, so uh, Syria. By, 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 yeah. by, by the way, I just uh, I, I don't think I can I can point this out enough, but uh, I, I will because Muslims claim that they're you know, claim that they respect Jesus and have have reverence for Jesus. And, ah, we follow Jesus better than you Christians. Um, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, talked about fasting. And he said, if you're, if you're fasting and you want people to know about it, and you're doing it for a show, then that's all the reward you get. So if you really want to fast, don't let anyone know that you're fasting. Do not let anyone know that you're fasting. Let it be between you and God, and you keep that a total secret. Uh, not only do Muslims announce to the entire world that they're fasting, not only is it all public and all for show, they go so far as to say, well, if we're fasting, everyone else has to fast along with us. And it's like, <laughs> look, you can, you know, at the end of the day, you can, you can do whatever you want with your, your fast, but my goodness, you could not contradict Jesus any more than you possibly do. Stop pretending that you actually have any respect whatsoever for Jesus. Indeed. Okay, Amazon.com, David. In 2017, there was a book published by my friend, the investigative journalist, Leo Homan, called Stealth Invasion. And I'll read you a little bit of the description of the book. Stealth Invasion blows the lid off a corrupt, fraudulent program that has been secretly dumping third world refugees, many of them radical, on American cities for three decades. Readers will meet the people and groups behind this shadowy resettlement network, which starts at the United Nations and includes the White House, the U.S. State Department, some surprising church groups, and corporate honchos, etc., etc. Now, I'm well aware of the uh, stories that went into making that volume because I reported many of them at Jihad Watch as they happened. And so it didn't seem to me, at very least, to be remotely controversial. And Stealth Invasion came out. It got some attention from book buyers, and that was it, really. Pretty state straightforward story. There is the book, Stealth Invasion by Leo Homan. But Amazon, this past week, actually banned it from sale after six years. And they sent a notice to the publisher. Our content review team re-reviewed the title Stealth Invasion and determined that it includes content against our content guidelines. The primary purpose is to paint Muslim immigration to the U.S. and Europe as treacherous, violent, and as a weapon used by the Muslim Brotherhood to change the U.S. from inside. For this reason, the team is upholding their decision to ban the book. Now, what's wrong with this picture, David? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm not crazy about the idea that you have uh, companies that become virtual monopolies. Um, and like the only place you can sell anything because it's the only place most people buy, uh, then decides what you're allowed to say and not say. Um, but 
Yeah, uh, sadly, I think we're going to see more of this because once you find out, hey, if we complain enough, we could get books, books shut down and so on. And then no one's allowed to disagree with us. I can think of one major group that's going to take advantage of that policy. <laughs> yes, indeed. As always. It, it, and it's, it's I mean, notice it's, it's the same thing with social media or, or anyone else. Uh, people find out, hey, we can um, we can't control the speech directly sometimes by enforcing it through violence or, and so on. But we can we can get the same result by complaining. Uh, notice it. And notice it. It's always the same goal in Islam, whether it's whether it's extremely peaceful uh, Muslims or jihadis. It's always we are going to control what you say in one way or another. Indeed. That's what it's about, supremacy. The non-Muslims have to feel themselves subdued. By the way, he said he called that a stealth invasion. And I was thinking, that sounds like stealth jihad. Weren't, weren't you the one that, that coined that? Were you the one that coined the, the, yep. the, the phrase stealth jihad to describe that, that sort of first stage of jihad? David, I wrote the book, Stealth Jihad, nice. back in 2008. And way, way back in the day. Way back in the palmy days of the first decade of this century the book stealth jihad let's see if i can find it there it is um still available on amazon ladies and gentlemen the book stealth jihad for now that outlines that's right for now <laughs> that uh outlines the non-violent attempts to advance the sharia agenda in the um, United States. And I would expect that probably, I haven't looked at that book in many years, like I say, it's 15, 14 years since I, 15 years since I wrote it, but uh, I would expect that everything in there is abundantly established by now. Um, the, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it's one of the books that if someone read it, they would go, wow, he's a prophet. <laughs> Yes. Everything he said is what we ex is exactly what we see all around us, huh? It was so hard to foresee, David. Yep. Who who could have foreseen it? Well, anyone with the ability to read, but okay. Now, one of the things that uh, I discuss in that book, as I recall, actually, is the control of the media and the total lockstep that the establishment media marched in. Yes, there is a Kindle version of Stealth Jihad. You can check that on Amazon for the moment, at least. In any case, uh, the media only reports what the Islamic groups wanted to, whether that's because they're paid or some other reason, I don't know. But in any case, we had this from DC News Now last week. DC News Now is not a huge news outlet, but I took this as kind of representative. They did an instruction piece on Ramadan called Ramadan 2023. Everything you need to know about Islam's holiest month. And they go on, Ramad Muslims use Ramadan as an opportunity to self-reflect and become more spiritual. Muslims that's, will fast. That's blah, blah. their jihad. <laughs> that, that's their jihad. What's yours? What do you think they left out of this everything you need to know about Ramadan piece, David? I don't know, maybe all the bloody violent attacks that have been happening in Islam since that first generation during Ramadan. Astonishing. How did you know that? I don't know. It's just that ability to read keeps getting in my way. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Vienna, a uh, Muslim politician has demanded that the uh, city of Vienna be decorated for Ramadan the way that the city of London is. And I think that that's only fair, after all. Uh, once you have a massive Muslim presence, then you might as well go all the way. And it's going to happen eventually anyway, whether you want to or not. Yay! We're fasting! Entire <laughs> world, look at us. Look at us f pretending to fast. We're going to gorge ourselves multiple times per day while we're fasting. We're going to consume far, far, far far more food than we do at any other point in the year but we want all the attention in the world we want all the attention for fasting yep just like just like jesus didn't say indeed there's another big islamophobia incident in 
Canada, David, I'm sorry to say, mm. there was a uh, Muslim on the Via Rail a train, and he went to pray in the middle of an aisle. And people were trying to get by, so the conductor told the guy to move. Don't, oh. don't pray in here. We don't want you praying here. You're bothering other customers, okay? Pray outside next time. Bunch of bigots. Well, yeah. Everybody had to stop and not be able to pass through the train while he was praying, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Th what these, are the, the, these are the same sort of bigots where if you went and just blocked traffic by, by bowing down and praying, they would, probably, they would probably think that there's a problem with that, too. Yeah, it's incredible. I don't know, man. This Islamophobia is just never going to end. But they're fixing it in Sweden, David. Good, good, good. Now, I do have a story. It's a little bit, it's not quite this week. And ordinarily I wouldn't do this, but this story came to my attention this week. It's from January, and I thought it was so important that it is worth mentioning. It's out of Sweden. And Sweden, the Church of Sweden, I have to clarify, a lot of people I saw when I put this on Twitter, they assumed this was the Catholic Church of Sweden. The Church of Sweden is Lutheran. And so it is not the Catholic Church for what that's worth. It's a major Christian church in any case. And the uh, outgoing Archbishop, Antia Jakelen, she started to use, as a matter of fact, if you go to her Twitter, you can see it where she says in, she doesn't say it in Arabic, but she does say it in Swedish. She says, God is greater. She even gets it right. That is the uh, the exact translation of Alaku Akbar. I'm impressed. So she said that uh, not only does she say Alaku Akbar, but she said that uh, Muhammad was a prophet. And her successor, she has now left office, and her successor, Martin Modeus, has now written an article that says that Muslims can join the Church of Sweden. Now, we all knew that Muslims could join the Church of Sweden, but up until Martin Modeus wrote this article, we thought they had to be Christians first. <laughs> what, what Martin Modeus is saying, the Archbishop of the Church of Sweden, is that Muslims, as Muslims, can join the Church of Sweden. Now, why might people in the Church of Sweden come to regret this invitation, David? Uh, I mean, I can think of all kinds of reasons, but I mean, I mean, based on just that invitation, if you're still remaining Muslims and being part of the Church of Sweden, I mean, last time I checked, um, you have in the book of Acts in the Bible, the apostles go out with the gospel. Now, Jesus had explained lots of things to them, but the, the takeaway message of the gospel was a message about Jesus death on the cross for sins, his resurrection from the dead, and his divine nature. So wherever the apostles went, it was death, resurrection, deity, death, resurrection, deity. Uh, he's Lord. You need to submit to him, and he's verified this by rising from the dead. Um, and so to say, uh, hey, you members of a religion that teaches the opposite of those things, uh, you can come in here as well. That means that you do not need even the most basics of the gospel anymore. You do not need the core of the gospel in order to be part of the church anymore. That's interesting. So really, the Church of Sweden is not in any functional way a Christian church anymore. It's yeah, like, something I, I, else. Like, how? Would, like, can you imagine Luther? <laughs> this, is a Luther this is a Lutheran church? <laughs> yeah. My goodness. Uh, yeah, I think that that's not going to go over very well, and that the Church of Sweden, in all seriousness, is likely on its last legs. Yeah, it's, speaking... I mean, it's, 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 it's got to be, based on what you just said, it's got to be basically a, like a social club right now, if you're... Exactly. exactly. If, it has no, if it has no meaningful doctrines that are, that are part of it, then it's just a social club. Right. Speaking of last legs, also, we have the fact that, also on Amazon... The uh, best-selling children's books about uh, best-selling children's books 
in France right now. Half of them are about Ramadan and Islam. Nice. So all you have to do is think about what that's going to be like in France in 20 years. Probably France will be very different from what it is today. In Spain also, the Muslim population has increased 10 times over the last 30 years. And so these things are going to be paying dividends in the next few decades. And we're going to see massive societal changes in those countries. David, we've come to the end of the hour, I see, and you have another show, so you want to plug uh, that show to send people over there. Yeah, sh uh, just uh, I just shared the link in the chat, but yes, I'm going live. We'll be up. I mean, you know, we still have to set up very quickly, so it'll take like two or three minutes, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to be live with Mike Jones of Inspiring Philosophy, who you'll be interested to know, Robert, has uh, begun addressing some claims of Islam. He's become he's become quite concerned about Islam's uh, about uh, Islam's teachings about child marriage. Excellent. Started bo started bothering. Now it's not what we're talking about in this live stream, but it's uh, it's interesting because I mean when I one of the reasons I ended up going in a route where I was dealing with Islam is just because there was no one dealing with it. There was you. There was Pamela Geller. There was Zachariah Boutros, and you know. But I mean, it's like. Mm -hmm. Lots of stuff going on. No one wants to touch it. Whereas now, everyone's starting to recognize problems and, and draw attention to them. So it's, uh, anyway, it's uh, good. Interesting times. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of Ramadan. God willing, we'll be back next week. If there is, in the, unli in the extraordinarily unlikely event, that there is more jihad during Ramadan. It's all just from based on a misunderstanding. And so probably there will be no more shows in Ramadan. But if... There are, we'll be here. Thank you. Good night. God bless.